my directions as to how to get here. I'll spare you then. <laughs> uh, it uh, may seem a bit odd or even maybe perverse to use the title Deterring Democracy for a discussion of uh, U.S. policies uh, at home and abroad. Uh, we are, after all, supposed to be basking in pride uh, over having served as an inspiration for the triumph of democracy in our time, quoting an editorial in the New Republic. Uh, given that, how can it be uh, suggested that uh, the United States actually has a dedicated and persistent commitment to uh, undermine and deter democracy throughout the world, uh, not least at home. Uh, actually, there's no conflict between those two propositions. They're both true. It's true, on the one hand, that we're an inspiration for the triumph of democracy in our time, and it's also true that the U.S. has been dedicated to preventing and uh, undermining democracy. Uh, uh, in order to uh, reconcile the apparent conflict, you just have to bear in mind something important and common knowledge about reading anything concerning affairs that matter. Uh, the terms of political discourse, including democracy, typically have two meanings. Uh, on the one hand, there's the dictionary meaning. Uh, on the other hand, there's uh, what we might call the PC meaning, now using the term in its accurate sense, uh, the meaning, the doctrinally correct meaning, the meaning that's used for purposes of ideological warfare. And those two meanings are often uh, diametrically opposed. So in the case of democracy, there are two meanings. Uh, in the dictionary sense of the word, uh, a society is democratic uh, insofar as the general public has the possibility of participating in some meaningful fashion in management of public affairs. Uh, a lot of dimensions of that, and insofar as that's true, the society is democratic. In the doctrinally correct sense, a society is democratic insofar as it's uh, under the firm control of business interests uh, linked to U.S. power, and that applies at home as well, and the general public is marginalized. Now, separating out those two meanings, it's perfectly possible to be an inspiration for the triumph of democracy in the world in the doctrinally correct sense, and to be opposed systematically to democracy at home and abroad in the dictionary sense of the word, and in fact, I think that's exactly what we find. Uh, there is a, uh, there, there's an ideological system which describes us as dem democratic ourselves, leading democratic country, fighting for democracy everywhere. Uh, there is also a truth that we're opposing democracy at home and abroad. Both are true, just in different senses of democracy. Actually, the term United States also has two meanings, and they have to be separated. Uh, on the one hand, the United States can stand for the people who live in this geographical area. On the other hand, it can refer to the rulers, uh, the people who feel entitled to and do, in fact, uh, manage and control the society, and those are just two different groups. And it's been that way ever since the origins of the Republic. It's been founded on that basis. Uh, it's well to remember the guiding maxim of, in fact, it was the favorite, uh, favorite saying of John Jay, the president of the Constitutional Convention, that those who own the country ought to govern it. Uh, and that's the way it was supposed to be. And when rebellious farmers around Massachusetts didn't understand that, they had it driven into their heads by force. Uh, and that's the way the society was established. It's the way the legal system was established. Uh, and it's the way it's been run ever since. Those who own the country are supposed to govern it. And if they do, and the general public is quiet and passive, it's a democracy in the doctrinally correct sense. Uh, the public often gets out of hand, and when the public gets out of hand and tries to enter the arena of public affairs, there's a name for that too. It's called a crisis of democracy, uh, which has to be overcome. Uh, that was the title of, if you want to really understand the United States, probably the most, one of the most important books one could read in my opinion, is a book called The Crisis of Democracy, published in 1975. And when people started reading it quickly, it pulled out of circulation, but then it sort of sneaked back in. It was published by the Trilateral Commission. It's their only major publication. 
Uh, it was a, uh, uh, the Trilateral Commission is a is sort of the liberal side of the international ruling class. You know, it's the people around Jimmy Carter. In fact, he came out of there. Uh, Clinton too, I think. Uh, it's the sort of you know the liberal wing of the international elites, business, uh, academic, and so on. Trilateral because it involves Europe, Japan, and the United States. Uh, in the early 70s, they were particularly concerned over the crisis that had arisen in the 1960s, namely that large sectors of the population who are usually apathetic and marginal and you know, watching the Super Bowl or something, uh, were becoming involved in public affairs, were trying to enter the political arena to press their demands and to become organized and so on. Now, in the dictionary sense of the word, that's democracy, but in the PC sense, that's a crisis democracy which has to be overcome, and the, you know, the scholars and others, American was a professor from Harvard who wrote the statement, they uh, describe how it's necessary to overcome this crisis to uh, restore the public to apathy and passivity, uh, and as the professor of government at Harvard put it, to go back to the days when Truman was able to run the country with the aid of a few Wall Street lawyers and financiers. That was the good old days before the crisis erupted, and we have to somehow go back to that. And in fact, there's been a major ideological offensive for the past 20 years to try to overcome this crisis uh, and to try to restore the proper state of things. Now, it all makes perfect sense. We can be an inspiration for democracy, and we can be concerned about the crisis of democracy when the public starts getting involved in public affairs. All makes sense as long as you just keep the wording straight and remember that everything's got a, there's a new speak version and there's an English version, and you just have to separate them out. It gets a little tricky sometime, but if you think it through, it works fine. Uh, actually, the example that I quoted from the New Republic illustrates this quite dramatically. Uh, that statement about the inspiration you know, for democracy in our time uh, came in a, an, an article exulting over the outcome of the February 1990 elections in Nicaragua, which happened to illustrate very clearly exactly how democracy is understood by across the spectrum of educated opinion in the United States. There's a liberal conservative difference, but it falls together on important issues like this one. And it's worth having a look at it closely because it does illustrate what is meant by democracy and what, you know, what it, the sense in which we try to inspire, we in this sense, you know, the rulers, try to inspire and create democracy. Uh, actually, it's worth going back a couple of months to November 1989 uh, it was an interesting date because that was the date when the Berlin Wall fell. And after that time, unless you're really pretty crazed, you couldn't believe that the Russians are coming. So any pretense that the bad things we do are in reaction to the Russian threat could no longer be upheld. I mean, could never be upheld, but certainly after, February, uh, after November 1989, I was hopeless. Uh, everybody except real fanatics, you know, had maybe there's some people around who still think they're, you know, kind of trying to uh, mislead us and they're really going to come back at our throats, but people who are moderately sane abandoned the idea that the Cold War was on at that time. Uh, so for, it's very interesting then to look at events since November 1989 to see just how much has changed. And if you look, you see nothing's changed, which tells you exactly what the Cold War was, but uh, that's a different topic. In any event, on this topic, on democracy, uh, November 1989 was interesting. There were, uh, November 1889, there were, in fact, elections in uh, Honduras, which had been under U.S. control at that point for 10 years. And uh, the elections were described by George Bush as an inspiring example of the democratic promise that today is spreading throughout the Americas. So we inspire the world, and Honduras is kind of a little country, so they only inspire the Americas. Uh, and in fact, there was an election. There were, was, there were two candidates. Uh, one of them represented large landowners. The other represented big industrialists. Uh, they had the identical programs. Uh, therefore, there was no, dis uh, there was, a, there was a, a campaign, but it was just insults and entertainment, kind of not unlike one that appeared to the North a few months earlier. Uh, the, uh, 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 the effective rulers of the military, 
and uh, who are under U.S. control. Uh, the, uh, during the period right up to the election, the, there's a regular low level of human rights abuses, you know, killings and so on and so forth. It's not like El Salvador or Guatemala, it's just kind of low level. Uh, and that escalated a bit before the election, so you had union leaders killed and left by the roadside and that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, uh, starvation and misery are rampant and increasing. Uh, they'd increased considerably during the decade of democracy, as it's called, uh, along with capital flight and huge debt and, uh, uh, and so on. It's an extraordinarily poor country, but profits are flowing. There's no real threat to order. Uh, the level of state terror is low enough, so you don't have to get too exercised about it. You know, some torture, some killing, but not massive. Uh, uh, so therefore, it's uh, an inspiring example of democracy. Then we're all happy about it. We've brought democracy to Honduras, and we can be inspired. Uh, November 1989, the same month, was the opening of the uh, electoral campaign in Nicaragua. Now, Nicaragua had, in fact, had elections in 1984, uh, but those elections were not an inspiring example of democracy. Uh, the reason is that they couldn't be controlled. Uh, and therefore they don't qualify. Uh, it's therefore been necessary to write them out of history. And in fact, they are out of history in the United States. Uh, you're not allowed to mention them. Uh, the press can't mention them. Uh, it was necessary to suppress completely the fact that the Latin American Studies Association, the Professional Association of Latin American Scholars, had a detail, you know, had a very, the closest uh, analysis of an election on the spot that they'd ever had. And, you know, I thought it was quite good and so on. Same was true of uh, hostile observers. It was very widely observed. The Dutch government sent a very hostile uh, 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 official delegation which reluctantly conceded that the elections were fine. Uh, the Irish parliament had a right-wing delegation which drew the same conclusion as the British parliament had the same and so on. All this had to be, exc n none of this can be mentioned in the press ever could. There never were elections. That's a dogma. In, PC usage, there were no elections, but they were going to have them in 1990. Uh, this time, the U.S. was taking no chances. Uh, as the electoral campaign opened in November 1989, uh, Violeta Chamorro, the U.S. candidate, was brought to Washington for photo opportunities, and the White House issued a statement uh, saying that the U.S. embargo, uh, which was strangling the country, would be maintained unless the U.S. candidate won. So Nicaraguans are told, vote for our person or watch your children starve. Uh, next, Congress and the White House jointly uh, uh, continued the support for the terrorist forces that the U.S. was running from Honduras. Uh, they called it humanitarian aid, but that was a lie. Uh, that had already been determined by the World Court, uh, which determined officially, and again, that's something you can't cite here, that it was not humanitarian aid, it was military aid. The uh, White House Congress uh, decision to continue it uh, and to maintain the level of terror was in violation of the decision of the Central American presidents, the decision of the World Court, uh, the UN, which is irrelevant because the U.S. just vetoed every resolution that came along. Uh, and that was the next step. Uh, the uh, media continued, as they had in the past, to suppress all of this. I mean, you really have to be an addict to figure it out. It's there, you know, if you look carefully, but nobody would know. Uh, the Nicaraguans were essentially informed that uh, only a vote for the U.S. candidate could end the terror and uh, end the uh, economic strangulation. Uh, and in fact, uh, there, which was of course both illegal, both in fact condemned by the World Court, uh, that was the condition for the election. So the, play, the playing field was level, as we put it. And uh, there was an election, and it was kind of interesting to look at the reactions to it north and south of the Rio Grande. Uh, actually, I wrote an article about it if you're interested in the data, but uh, south of the Rio Grande through Latin America, it was described simply as a victory for George Bush. Uh, a lot of, by the right wing, incidentally, the press is mostly right wing because any other press has been m murdered or destroyed. Uh, and they liked the outcome, but it was simply flatly described as a victory for George Bush, not as an election which is exactly the way we would have described it if something similar had taken place, say, in Lithuania under you know, a Russian terrorist attack or something. Uh, 
In the United States, on the other hand, it was uniformly described as uh, the way the New York Times put it in a headline, victory for U.S. fair play. Uh, in fact, the big U.S. article, uh, New York Times article was called Americans United in Joy over the victory for U.S. fair play. Uh, actually, that phrase itself is interesting. There are countries where you find things like you know, united in joy, like maybe Albania, you know, or North Korea. You could imagine Albanians united in joy over something or other, uh, or other countries where totalitarian culture is in force. Uh, so it was Americans united in joy over victory for U.S. fair play. Uh, and it's not that people were unaware of how the victory was achieved. They were pretty frank about it, in fact. Uh, so here's Time magazine. Uh, Time magazine described, I'm quoting, uh, the means that were employed to bring about what they called the latest, the, ha the latest in the happy series of democratic surprises as democracy uh, burst forth in Nicaragua. And the method was to wreck the economy and prosecute a long and deadly proxy war until the exhaustive natives overthrow the unwanted government themselves at a cost to us that is minimal Leaving, victim, leaving the victim with wrecked bridges, sabotaged power stations, and ruined farms, and thus providing the U.S. candidate with a winning issue, ending the impoverishment of the people of Nicaragua. Okay, that's the way we did it. So it's a victory for U.S. fair play, and Americans are united in joy. Well, uh, that frankness is kind of refreshing. I mean, you might find something similar in Nazi Germany or maybe Stalinist Russia, possibly, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, it tells you exactly what is meant by the Americans united, united in joy uh, over the victory for democracy. That's what they mean by democracy. Democracy is where you, you make it very clear by murder and terror and economic strangulation that you vote for us or else, uh, and then if it works, it's democracy. Okay, there we have democracy in the politically correct sense. And in that sense, as you know, I'm not making it up. I'm reading from the mainstream, in fact, even the liberal side of the mainstream, uh, you uh, have uh, an explanation of what democracy amounts to. Actually, some sim similar story is going on right now, uh, and it's going to be replayed in, uh, what's today, the 24th, in a couple of days in Angola. Uh, in a way, it's a, it's a re repetition of the Nicaragua story, but even uglier. Uh, there, the number of people who've been murdered is not... 30 or 40,000, but probably half a million or so. And the country's been totally devastated. Uh, uh, from 1975, the country has been under attack, first by, by South Africa uh, and by uh, uh, the US run terrorist forces, UNITA, uh, uh, attacking the country first from Namibia, as long as it was possible to hang on to that, and then switched over to Zaire, another US kind of colony. Uh, the United States is almost alone in the world in refusing to recognize the Angolan government since 1975. Uh, the South African forces continued to attack until, I think it was 1990, they, were, they suffered a defeat by the Cuban forces that were there to defend the country against South African aggression, which is considered an absolute atrocity in the United States that there were Cubans there trying to stop South African aggression. Uh, uh, the, uh, after that, South Africa withdrew, uh, and there was an agreement, a peace, so -called peace agreement in May 1991, which called for elections that are supposed to come off uh, in a few days, 29th and 30th of September. Exactly as in Central America, exactly as in Central America, after the peace agreements, the U.S. moved at once to subvert it, subvert them. Uh, it continued to uh, offer support to the uh, UNITA forces, who are, who are vicious terrorists. I mean, there's not much doubt about that. They take credit for shooting down civilian airliners, uh, torture, all sorts of things. Uh, the, uh, here's the way it's described by a, South, a good South African reporter, Philip van Niekerk, who sometimes writes for the Boston Globe. You may have seen him. He's one of the best South... He was a Neiman Fellow a little while back. Uh, he, writing from Angola, writes that uh, Savimbi, the head of UNITA, has the, has the edge in the election, the peasants don't like UNITA, but most of the people are afraid that if UNITA loses the elections, the war will go on. People are aware of the atrocities committed by UNITA and appalled at the prospects that they might win the election, but continuation of the war is more than they can bear. 
uh, with millions of dollars of U.S. aid. UNITA is well placed to run a high profile election campaign with plenty of handouts for voters. Uh, he says that a new, a new wave of white settlers is now recolonizing Angola, uh, Afrikaners, mostly South Africans, and later perhaps Portuguese returning to reclaim their lands. It's an old Portuguese colony if Savimbi wins. Uh, Victoria Britton, who reports on S Southern Africa for the London Guardian, uh, says that the only optimism now comes from the South African businessmen in the hotels in Luanda, the capital, uh, uh, who say if UNITA wins, uh, we'll have the country handed to us on a plate, and if the MPLA, the government wins, uh, they'll, we'll still have the country for a handful of rands, South African coins, because it's so devastated, there's nothing else left. So here's a country, total ruins, hundreds of thousands of killed, uh, under, still under attack by terrorist forces, and when the election comes, if it comes out the right way, Americans will again be united in joy over the inspiring victory of uh, democracy. In fact, we're already united in joy. Anthony Lewis, who's at absolutely the outer limits of dissent in the, in the U.S. media, uh, had a column a couple of weeks ago in which he was just gushing with praise over what he called the consistent American policy from the 1970s to help negotiate an end to the brutal civil war in Angola. That's the civil war that we kept maintaining uh, while blocking every effort to stop it. Uh, and the successful pursuit of the Bush administration of a peaceful policy aiming at a political solution in Nicaragua, which is what I just described. Uh, well, that's the attitude toward democracy. Uh, it continues right at the, with, after the Cold War is over, it continues with absolutely no change. Uh, September, here's another little later, September 1990, there was a Latin American strategy development workshop held in Washington, uh, and it, uh, academics and others, and it described relations with Mexico, which is uh, a, a really vicious dictatorship. It described relations with the Mexican dictatorship as, as they put it, extraordinarily positive uh, completely untroubled by stolen elections, by death squads, uh, by what Amnesty International calls endemic torture, uh, scandalous treatment of workers and peasants, so all that stuff was fine, but there's one problem, here it is. A democracy opening in Mexico could test the special relationship by bringing into office a government more interested in challenging the United States on economic and nationalist grounds. So we gotta watch out. Uh, everything is okay now, you know, it's run by gangsters and terrorists, but there might be a democracy opening, in which case there might be a challenge to the United States on nationalist and economic grounds, so that's a problem. Uh, and in fact, this is an internal conference, people aren't supposed to read it. Uh, and, uh, but anyone who's familiar with the internal record of planning recognizes this right off. Uh, they are simply reiterating cliches, the standard position uh, of U.S. planners with regard to the third world in general is exactly what they say. Uh, it's uh, uh, the threat to U.S. interests in the third world is nationalism, uh, democracy, anything that might involve popular pressures. And it's explicit in planning documents from way back, particularly with regard to Latin America, because that's the one we run most closely. Uh, the threat to U.S. interest is identified as what are called radical and, radical and nationalist regimes, which might be responsive to pressures from the mass of the population for improvement in low living standards and diversification of production for domestic needs. Now, why is that a threat? Because uh, our interest is preservation of a satisfactory climate of investment with adequate repatriation of profits and protection of our resources and that's going to be interfered with by economic nationalism, by radical and nationalist regimes, uh, by regimes that are enough under popular pressure. It doesn't matter whether they're right, left, anything else that's kind of irrelevant. But if they're under the kinds of popular pressures which might regard the local population as a priority, that's no good because the priority is uh, the local business classes and Western investors. So there's a conflict and we've got to block them. If we can have formal democracy like Honduras, while the groups who are attuned to U.S. interests and subject to uh, U.S. demands are in power, then it's democracy and it's inspiring. If it's anything else, 
terror, economic strangulation, torture, and so on. Well, that tells you precisely what uh, uh, the attitude toward democracy is, and it's not just democracy. Uh, so say George Kennan, who's one of the more, one, actually one of the most influential post-war planners, but also one of the most humane, uh, had an important, when he was head of the policy planning staff of the State Department back in 1948, he's really one of the main architects of the post-war world, uh, he had an important study, declassified now, uh, in which he dis discussed the whole third world, described how we have to deal with each part of it, and the general line was, as he put it, that we must put aside vague and idealistic slogans like uh, democratization, human rights, and raising of the living standards, uh, and be prepared to use straight power concepts. Uh, and if we don't do that, we will not be able, he said, to maintain the disparity uh, between our wealth and their poverty. So let's put aside any vague and idealistic slogans about democratization, raising the living standards, or human rights. And that's exactly what we've done. The U.S. is consistently opposed to democracy in the dictionary sense in the third world for the obvious reason that if a country is democratic, it's going to be, to the extent that it's democratic, it's going to reflect popular interests, but those are inconsistent with what are regarded as U.S. interests, namely the interest in exploitation, uh, investment, uh, raw materials, and so on. The third world is supposed to be a service area. They're supposed to provide resources, raw materials, uh, cheap labor, markets, nowadays opportunities for export of pollution, and if they get out of control, they've got to do something about it. Uh, that position is across the spectrum. Uh, of course, there are rhetorical flourishes, uh, but if you look at actual policy and even the, the, the way in which policy is formulated internally, it's quite consistent about this. And under those assumptions, you can understand why a victory for terror and economic strangulation would be regarded as a victory for fair play, and the Americans would be united in joy about it, the right kind of Americans, that is, the ones who count. Uh, we have followed Kennan's advice not only with regard to democracy. Uh, anybody who knows anything about the South, can t and, and you do, I'm sure, it doesn't have to be told about uh, living standards, which are abysmal. They make Eastern Europe look like a paradise. Uh, the, uh, uh, with regard to human rights, uh, there have been a number of studies, and they're interesting. There's a relationship between U.S. policy and human rights, a uh, close relationship, in fact. Uh, namely, I'll just quote the leading academic scholar on uh, human rights in Latin America, Lars Schultz, who's one of the several people who've studied this in detail. Uh, he said, U.S. aid tends to flow to the most egregious violators of human rights in the hemisphere to countries that torture their citizens. And in fact, that's worldwide. There's a very close correlation between torture and U.S. aid. Uh, it's not that U.S. planners like torture. They don't care one way or another about torture. But they like something else. What they like is a favorable climate for investment. Uh, and it just happens that the way to maintain a favorable climate for investment is to murder priests and uh, kill union leaders and uh, you know, blow up the independent press and so on and so forth. So you get a secondary correlation between aid, which goes to improving the investment climate and human rights violations. That correlation, incidentally, doesn't influence the uh, cultural managers. So they continue to tell us about the deep U.S. dedication to human rights because it's a matter of logic. It's independent of facts, and logic can't be computed, confuted by mere fact, as anyone knows. Uh, so, in, in fact, Kennan's advice has been, uh, been followed quite correctly, and in particular with regard to democracy. Well, that's the third world. Maybe it's different elsewhere. Uh, what about the industrial societies, um, you know, Europe? Uh, here, the problem, these are stable societies. They're, you know, they run without too much institutional change. But if you look back at the, there, there's a dramatic period. There's an important period which, in which the question of democracy in the industrial societies did arise namely right after the Second World War. Uh, Second World War the in, after the Second World War, the industrial world, was most of it was devastated outside the United States. Uh, and it had to be reconstructed. And the U.S. Was, had a position of overwhelming power, just overwhelming power. It was going to redesign the industrial societies. 
and it had the power to do it. Japan, Germany had both been defeated. They were the, what were called the great workshops, you know, the major industrial societies. Same was true of Italy, uh, France, and so on. It had to be reconstructed. How was it going to be done? Well, if you look at what happened in the late 40s, uh, you see exactly how it was done. It was done with remarkable consistency. They were all over the world, it was the same, from South Korea and Japan all the way over to Italy and France. Uh, first thing that had to be done was to destroy the anti-fascist resistance, which just had too much credibility, and it was popular-based. Uh, the traditional conservative order had been discredited by its association with fascism, but that was the traditional business order, and that had to be reinstated in power. So all over the world, what the, the first, first chapter of post-war history was to undermine and destroy the anti-fascist resistance and to restore the traditional rulers. And it was done without exception, you know, country after country. Sometimes it had required bloody violence. So in Greece, it required a civil war in which about 160,000 people were killed. In South Korea, about 100,000 people were killed before what we call the Korean War in repression to try to restore the old order. Uh, in Western Europe, it was, you know, I didn't have to kill that many people. It was done in other ways, but it was done. That meant destroying, at least undermining, uh, labor, uh, restoring fascist collaborators. Uh, in Japan, uh, the old fascist system was basically reconstructed with the democratic forces crushed, uh, unions pretty much destroyed, and so on. Uh, same happened in Germany. Uh, Italy was a dramatic case because it looked as if it was out of control for a while. There was an election in Italy in 1948, and it was widely expected that the communists would win. They, were, they had the prestige of having led the anti-Nazi resistance. Uh, they were supported by labor. They were pretty independent. And it was widely assumed that they were going to win. Uh, there was a split among US planners at that time as to what to do. Uh, George Kennan uh, thought we ought to invade, not even let the election take place. Uh, others figured it's not necessary. We can buy it off. Uh, and in fact, they let the election go, but not but careful. Uh, Italy was starving. The U.S. could control the food. Uh, food supplies were, it was made extremely clear that if the communists won, the place was going to starve. Food supplies were held back. The fascist police was reinstated. Unions were attacked. There was a whole range of threats that were used, uh, and they worked. Uh, but there was a reserve plan. The National Security Council had just been formed at that point, CIA, the whole national security apparatus, and the first National Security Council memorandum, NSC-1, uh, this is the highest level planning group. The first one is the, in 1948 is devoted to Italy, and it describes a series of measures that will, be, should, that will be taken if the election comes out the wrong way, which includes support for terrorist forces within Italy and national mobilization in the United States, uh, and in fact, direct military intervention if nothing else works. That's NSC-1. They weren't kidding around, but fortunately, the threat of starvation and strangulation worked. Uh, there were other ideas planned. They thought that there are too many Italians in Italy. Part of the problem is there's just too much population there, and they're too disruptive. So what you have to do is thin out the population. And a secret plan was adopted. Actually, this was just, just came, made public rather recently in the last two or three years uh, as part of the Marshall Plan uh, to send them somewhere else. Well, where? Well, they didn't want them here. We had plenty of WAPs in the United States already, as they were referred to, incidentally, in internal documents. Uh, plenty of WAPs here already. We didn't want any more of them. Uh, Europe had a, uh, a problem of over, you know, too many people around they didn't know what to do with. So it was decided to send them off to Latin America. Uh, and uh, Congress, therefore, allocated funds for ships uh, to send Italians. Oh, they decided on Brazil. They thought that'd be the best place sent them off to Brazil. Uh, 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 Brazil was given aid to try to absorb them. And the idea was to try to thin out the disruptive population so we didn't have this crisis of democracy. Uh, US intervention to subvert Italian democracy continues at least until the mid-70s. Uh, that's when the record runs dry. And nobody knows if it went on after that. But, and it was pretty serious. It involved uh, support for neo-fascist organizations, uh, preparation for military coups, and so on. Uh, the, uh, subverting democracy is not a small problem. It's, got a, it's taken very seriously. Once the traditional conservative business order was reestablished in Europe, in the industrial societies, 
then it could just run. But up until then, it was a problem. Uh, what about at home? Last part of the story in the United States. Uh, well, uh, here there's a theory about democracy too. I already mentioned a little bit of it. Uh, the theory is that those who own the country ought to govern it. Uh, and uh, we have to figure out ways to make that happen. Uh, that was, of course, the founding fathers. Now it's this is the 20th century. People are more sophisticated. So there's much more elaborate theories, and they're worked out in some detail. And they have to, there's a spectrum of opinion about it. Over, the most interesting is the kind of liberal side. Uh, that's people like the Trilateral Commission with their crisis of democracy. Uh, if you look at what are called progressive essays on democratic theory by American academics and others, uh, there's a strain that runs through them. It was sometimes put very clearly. It was put perhaps most clearly by Walter Lippmann in his what are called progressive essays on democ democratic theory back in the 1920s. He was a you know, major intellectual figure and the dean of American journalism and so on. And his essays back in the 20s when he wrote about this stuff are quite interesting. Uh, he explained that in a democracy, there are two classes of people. There are the people that he called the responsible men. Sometimes they're called the political class or some other name, small segment of the population. Uh, and those are the ones who have to rule. And then there's the, the rest, who he said are the bewildered herd. Uh, and we, have, we, the responsible men, have to protect ourselves from the trampling and the rage of the bewildered herd. Now, it's a democracy, not a fascist state. So the bewildered herd has a function, he said. They have a function. Their function is to be spectators, not participants. Uh, and as spectators, since, again, it's a democracy, they're allowed something else. He said, periodically, they may lend their weight to one or another member of the responsible men. That's called an election. So periodically, something comes along, and a couple of different members of the ruling group of responsible men come forward and say, you know, you can choose among us. Uh, and then the spectators are allowed to choose, and then they're supposed to go back and be spectators again. That's democracy. Uh, the, uh, the, you go to the academic side, you know, people like, say, Harold Laswell, who's founder of modern political communication theory and all that stuff. Uh, his wrote a, he wrote about this again in the 1930s. He said, we must not succumb to democratic dogmatisms uh, about uh, men being the best judges of their own interests. They're not. He said, we're the best judges of their interests. Uh, we can't control them by force because we don't have that kind of state, so we have to control their thinking. Uh, we have to make sure that the, since the voice of the people is heard, we've got to make sure it says the right thing. And as he puts it, propaganda, they used to call it frankly in those days, propaganda is uh, in a democracy has approximately the role that force has in a military run state or a totalitarian state. It's a way of keeping the bewildered herd under control. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the great respected theologian, the guru of, called the theologian of the establishment, uh, his position was that the, uh, he said the the cool observers, you know, the rational and cool observers, again, a small group, uh, have the responsibility of creating necessary illusions and emotionally potent oversimplifications to keep the rabble on course. Because they're just, and this is all done very benignly. The problem is that the mass of the population is just too stupid to know what's good for them. And if you let them be something more than spectators, they'll just get in trouble. So out of our benevolence, uh, we will create necessary illusions and uh, propaganda and uh, various devices of thought control to keep them out of things. Just keep them out of trouble. Uh, every once in a while, they're allowed to come and lend their weight to one or another of us, but then they go back to being spectators. Uh, that's democracy. Uh, that goes way back to the 17th century. You can trace all of this back to the first democratic uh, revolution in modern history, actually the 17th century uh, uprising in England, uh, which caused huge f amount of fear among elites who were concerned about what they called the rascal multitude, uh, beasts in men's shape, you know, kind of going to all kind of horrible things. They had to be crushed and returned to subordination, and then we could have democracy.
uh, and it goes right up till the present. It's a major strain in democratic theory uh, and probably the dominant strain. Uh, now, it does have various wings. There's a liberal wing and a sort of harsher wing and a softer wing. At the liberal side, you get people like, say, John Locke, who's noted as a libertarian theorist. But what people often don't remember is that beside his avocation, you know, writing essays on philosophy, uh, which is what you read in college, uh, he also had a vocation. He had a job. Uh, his job was in the colonial civil service. And in that job, he did things like write constitutions for the American colonies, say the Constitution of the Carolines. And there, he expressed what he really thought. So for example, in the Constitution of the Carolines, uh, citizens are not permitted to discuss public affairs. They're allowed to know about them, but they're not allowed to discuss them. That's a crime. Now, that makes them a liberal. They're allowed to know about them. Uh, in the modern times, that comes down to the Lippmann position. You are allowed to be a spectator. You, know, you can sort of watch. You're allowed to do that. On the conservative side, uh, what's called conservative, it's conservative is another term like democracy. I mean, the meaning of conservative is exactly the opposite of what it's applied to. What are called conservatives today are believer, people who believe in a very powerful interventionist state, which is protected from scrutiny and intervenes massively in economic affairs and so on and so forth. For some reason, that's called conservative, which, you know, it's just the, almost the exact opposite of what conservatism is. But anyhow, I'll continue with the doctrinally correct usage. Uh, the conservatives, their view is that uh, the spectators shouldn't even be allowed to know what's going on. So when you get a, something like, say, the Reagan years, uh, they don't believe that the spectators are even allowed to watch. Uh, and therefore, policy, you get a, what you t typically get in a conservative, like a Reagan administration striking, you get a great increase in clandestine operations. Well, what are clandestine operations? I mean, suppose you're running a clandestine terror in Nicaragua. It's not secret to anybody down there, you know, I mean, they see it. It's not secret to anybody else in the world who's funding it or whatever. In fact, it's not secret to anybody except the American population. Uh, operations are clandestine because you've got to keep the bewildered herd from knowing about them. They're not even allowed to know what's going on. Uh, the Reagan administration also set up the uh, largest state propaganda agency in American history, uh, the Office of uh, Public Diplomacy, it was called. Uh, the purpose of which was to control the public mind. They were actually to demonize the Sandinistas primarily. It was finally exposed and of course declared illegal and so on. And a high administration official who was asked about it said, well, you know, it's the kind of activity that you carry out in enemy territory, which is exactly right. The general public is enemy territory and you gotta control them. Uh, the, uh, uh, so the Reagan administration imposed, you know, there's a regular procedure by which the State Department declassifies documents from 30 years, theoretically it's supposed to be 30 years ago. Uh, they run through documents and they get declassified by some procedure. And they don't declassify everything, but they do quite a lot. Uh, and the Reagan administration imposed constraints so harsh that the whole group of State Department historians, who are a very conservative lot, resigned in protest because they couldn't release information from what had happened 30 years ago. And there was a big flap about it in the diplomatic history journals and so on. Well, you know, that's the right wing side of the spectrum. The bewildered herd shouldn't even know what's happening. Uh, the more liberal side says, yeah, they can know, but they're not allowed to talk about it. Or they're not allowed to do anything about it except occasionally vote. So that's essentially, that's the spectrum. Uh, the, uh, uh, actually, and you get an interesting picture of how this is supposed to work by taking a look at the Republican convention that just took place, uh, which was quite interesting from this point of view. Uh, I'm sure you, obviously you know. Uh, it started off with this God and Country rally, uh, which was a real throwback to, uh, you know, actually it was a throwback to the 1930s. You know, very reminiscent of Hitler Germany. That was noticed in Europe, incidentally. Uh, then along, even by conservatives in Europe, uh, then along came the platform, which was taken over by uh, evangelical extremists of a kind that don't even exist in most industrial societies. So they were given the program. Uh, and you know, then you get this, we're going to have a religious war and so on and so forth. I mean, there was interesting commentary about it in Europe. Uh, but for those who, you know, if you look at it with a little bit of a historical perspective, 
it's not unfamiliar. I mean, in, in periods where it's necessary to disperse and suppress the mass of the population, it's always been quite common to use uh, what are sometimes called psychic processes of counter-revolution. That's E.P. Thompson's phrase in his study of how uh, in the early stages of industrialization in England it was necessary to disperse and suppress the working classes. A uh, large uh, religious enthusiasm was a large part of that. Uh, it's a way to kind of disperse and control people. Uh, and the Republican Convention was very striking in that respect, the way it used these techniques. Uh, the point is you've got to keep people's attention away from what's going on around them. That's the main thing. Uh, and when any, it's a principle, it's almost like a principle of political theory that if any government, any state, is carrying out policies and is intent on carrying out policies that are going to be harmful to the mass of the population, it's going to necessarily, it doesn't matter if it's a totalitarian state or a democratic state or whatever, it's just, it's a systematic fact, an institutional fact that it's going to have to turn to policies which will distract, distract and divert the population. They can't be paying attention to what's happening around them or they're just not going to tolerate it. And there aren't a lot of ways to do this, which is why you see the same patterns recurring over and over. Uh, one way to do it is to frighten everybody to death. You know, so you have people cowering in terror, usually over a foreign enemy who's going to destroy them. Uh, and then the grand hero rescues them at the last minute. And while this whole drama is going on, at least they're not paying attention to what's going on around them. You know. uh, that pattern was reenacted every year or two during the 1980s. I mean, we had, they kept setting up conf totally fabricated confrontations with Libya. It was very convenient. They're just like a punching bag. They can't shoot back. They can do anything you like to them. Uh, Sandinistas were going to be marching on Texas. Uh, Grenada was going to cut off sea lanes. You know, you remember that stage. Uh, it crazed Arabs all over the place. You know, uh, uh, Hispanic narco traffickers are going to get us. Uh, one thing after another just to keep people terrified and was more of a problem in the 80s than it had been in earlier years because in earlier years you could always appeal to the Russians. I mean, maybe the threat was fabricated, but at least they were there, you know, and they were brutal and strong and so on. Uh, in the 1980s, they were visibly disappearing, and that was a big problem. Uh, so therefore, we had this kind of, you know, you keep churning out different, uh, different chimeras to defend yourself again. And it sort of works. I mean, the American population is probably the most frightened population in the world. Uh, I mean, the, you know, in fact, it's, it became a joke in Europe. Every couple of years, the tourism industry would collapse because Americans are afraid to travel to Europe, you know, where they're about 100 times as safe as in any American city uh, because maybe somebody's <laughs> going to be hiding behind a thing ready to kill them or something. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the right-wing European press was quite comical on this. I remember I went to England, just happened by accident. I was giving, going to England. It happened to be the day that the bombing of uh, Iraq started. Uh, and the day I got there, there was an article in the right wing, very ultra right wing spectator, which was talking about uh, how some group of American gun collectors, uh, you know, guys who run around with assault rifles or something, uh, were planning a meeting in Scotland, but they'd canceled it because they were afraid. You know, they were afraid to travel to Scotland because, you know, who knows, maybe there's, maybe Saddam Hussein will get you or something like that. Uh, that's, uh, and, and that's typical and understandable. You want to keep people's attention away. I mean, we know what's been going on in the last 10 years. I mean, you know, you know the way income's been redistributed. You can see the way infrastructure's collapsing. Uh, you can see what's happening to people's lives, but people had better not look at that. They'd better look at something else. Uh, 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 th there are other ways of doing it, too. You can look at a domestic enemy. Uh, that's been used, too. Now, we don't, uh, I mean, it's not the, the, well, you know, the, you, you read the way it's been done. Here's a couple of examples, uh, which say so you attack liberalism. It's a big thing is to attack liberalism. Here's some quotes. Liberalism with its demands for women's equality and denial of the ancient truth that a woman's world is her husband, her family, her children, and her home. Got to watch out about that. Uh, it's a sin against the will of the Almighty that hundreds upon thousands of his most gifted creatures should be made to sink in the proletarian swamp while Negroes from Africa are trained for the liberal professions. 
You know what I'm quoting, that's Hitler. You know? But how different is it? You know? That was Hitler giving talks at women's conferences in 1936 and so on and so forth. Strike some resonances. We're not, the code words are a little different, but the, the thoughts are very similar and the reasons are the same. The segment of the, the mass of the population is under attack by state policy and therefore they have to be mobilized somehow. You can't get them interested in what's going on around them. That would be a disaster. Uh, so what you have to do is construct, is, is frighten them, uh, turn them against each other, or create hatreds. Uh, it's very familiar. There are not many devices available and that's why you keep seeing the same ones over and over again. Uh, religious enthusiasm is an old one. It goes back to the 18th and 19th century. Uh, evangelicals in Central America do the same thing. You want to undermine liberation theology and you know, the preferential option for the poor or the church. Uh, what you do is send people down to create uh, what's sometimes called the chiliasm of despair. Nothing good is ever going to happen to you in this life. Forget it. You'll be okay in the next life. I mean, that central message. If it's done with uh, proper kinds of enthusiasm and excitement and speaking in tongues and so on, that's another technique. The techniques over the centuries are not very different. And if you look at the United States today, you see them manifested. And for exactly the structural reasons that always make them manifested. Uh, uh, namely, what's happening in the society right now and what's happening we know. It's captured rather nicely in a lead article in the New York Times business section a couple of days ago, uh, which is called, the headline is Paradox of 92. Uh, the paradox of 92 is that, uh, um, um, here's the subheading, weak economy, strong profits, paradox of 92. Then it starts off, America is not doing very well, but its corporations are doing just fine, paradox completely in inexplicable, you know, like some act of nature or something like that. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's not at all paradoxical. It's the exact consequence you expect when policy is being created by the people who are going to make the profits who are untroubled by the general public because they're marginalized the way they're supposed to be. Uh, they're out of it, you know, they're distracted or something. At least that's what's supposed to happen to them. Uh, this uh, 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 this uh, paradox of 92 uh, is now being translated directly into policy in other ways. So there's this phenomenon call, going on called the uh, uh, globalization of production. I mean, everybody's supposed to know that U.S. that the U.S. U.S. industry is declining. U.S. manufacturing is declining. Well, you know, again, if that's either true or false, depending on how you define U.S. If by U.S. you mean the people in the United States, that's true. U.S. manufacturing is declining significantly. If by U.S. you mean the people who own the country, it's increasing. So if you take the share in world manufacturing trade of U.S. owned corporations, it's either stable or increasing. That's another paradox. It just depends on which U.S. you mean. Uh, and the way it's happening is not secret. I mean. Today, for example, in the world's leading business paper, the Financial Times of London, there's an article hidden away there uh, which describes some, what General Motors is now up to. They've just closed 21 plants in the United States, but they're opening a big plant in East Germany. Uh, and it explains why. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric, but you get down to the end, it explains it very clearly. Wages are 40% lower than they are in West Germany. Uh, there are no benefits, there are higher hours, there's over 40% unemployment, so you can be sure to get people no matter how rotten the conditions are. Uh, now that Eastern Europe has been returned to its proper position in the third world as a service area, uh, GM can use it the same way they use Mexico. Uh, you get super cheap labor, it's Eastern Europe, so they're pretty well trained and pretty healthy and so on, not like our domain. Uh, and and uh, then for 40% lower wages, you can make good profits. You might as well close down the, uh, uh, the factories in the United States, or since they're talking about Europe, uh, they say so that the pampered West German workers uh, will have to have their standards undercut. They're not supposed to live pampered the way they are with you know, wages and decent wages and vacations and so on. And Eastern European uh, labor can be used to undercut them the same way that 
uh, Mexican labor, uh, that high repression areas where state violence is used to keep wages down, the same way that that goes on in the United States. If you want to see a graphic picture of how it's done in Central America, I'd urge you to look at uh, CBS 60 Minutes this Sunday, unless they chicken out at the last minute. They're supposed to have a segment on, uh, on uh, I don't want to give it away, but it'll be interesting if they run it. I'll tell you about it later. Uh, that's part of the, uh, on Central America and the, the way the U.S. Embassy is uh, helping firms move down to Central America so that they can undercut uh, wages and benefits for U.S. workers. That's essentially what it's about. Uh, the, uh, 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 a, a major feature of all of this is the raising of planning to a level where it's completely invisible to people. So there is what are, so the financial press is sometimes calling a new imperial age developing in which the major policies are not taken by state, by government institutions, but by transnational institutions, either the transnational corporations or else the G7 meetings, you know, the meetings of the big seven industrial powers, or the GATT negotiations, or the IMF, or the World Bank. That's where the big global decisions are made, which are then just translated down into policy in the individual countries. Now, in the third world, they just follow orders, but this is supposed to apply even to the industrial countries. Uh, and the so-called free trade arrangements, which are not that, uh, are a device to a significant extent to subordinate national planning, which has the danger that governments, however repressive they may be, have the defect that they may come under popular pressure. That defect is never eliminated. Uh, corporations don't have that problem. Uh, GATT doesn't have that problem, you know, the international trade negotiations, the IMF doesn't have that problem, so that's where, that's where decisions ought to be vested, and within the framework that they establish, uh, the governments can, you know, maneuver around in the little space that's left to them. Well, notice that this is a move towards the harsher end of the democratic spectrum, the end that says that people should not, the spectators should not even be allowed to know what's happening. I don't know how many of you read the discussions of the GATT negotiations in Geneva, but I'll bet not many. However, that's where the decisions are being made, uh, uh, and fortunately, they're totally out of any threat of democratic control. And you'll simply have to adhere to them because they're being made by the people who own the world, not just the country, uh, and that's the way it's supposed to run. Well, how does the last thing, how does the population react to all of this? It's an interesting question. Uh, we don't know a lot about it because people are not supposed to say anything. They're supposed to be watching television or something. But, this is a, but we do happen to know a lot about it. First of all, you know in personal experience. But there's also a lot of studies. Business is a very heavily studied country because business wants to keep its finger on the public pulse. So they want to know everything everybody's thinking. And we're constantly polled all the time. Uh, most of the polls are just for business use. But they're interesting. Uh, and if you look at them, you find some quite intriguing things. So for uh, we're supposed to be celebrating the, tr the, the fact that we, we have served as the inspiration for the triumph of democracy in our time. Remember, that's what the intellectuals say. Well, does the public think we ha are the inspiration for democracy in our time? Is that the way the public looks at our political institutions? Well, I don't have to waste any time on that one. Uh, however, more interesting is a more general point. The Harris Poll, every year, uh, has a range of questions which test what they call alienation from institutions, a measure of whether the extent to which you think that any institutions, political, economic, social, are doing anything for you or you have anything to do with them. And that number keeps going up. In 1991, the last one, it hit its peak so far. Two-thirds of the population thinks that none of the institutions involve them economic, social, anything. Political, it's much higher. Nobody thinks the political institutions do anything. Uh, the, uh, the individual questions are interesting. People were asked, uh, you know, what do you think about the economy? 83% of the population regards the economic system as inherent, inherently unfair. You know, something fundamentally wrong with it. Well, you know, that's not the kind of issue that can show up in a campaign. I mean, no candidate can come and say, look, our problem is our economic institutions. Uh, they're inherently unfair. I mean, maybe 83% of the population thinks it, but you know, nobody's going to say that, because that's not conducive to the needs of the people who own the country and therefore have to run it. Uh, 
In fact, the, the reporter who reported this, actually, he couldn't even, either he couldn't see it or he couldn't, or suppressed it. Uh, he said, well, what this means is people uh, are opposed to their overpaid politicians. But that's not what people were saying. They're not saying we're paid, we're opposed to our overpaid politicians. We're saying the economic system is inherently unfair. Uh, that's much deeper, you know, and you can understand why. All the decisions are out of public control. I mean, nobody makes any decisions about investment or production or distribution or whatever. That's completely out of public control. And people can see the consequences. You know, the, look around and you see the consequences. Uh, right through the Reagan years, um, people were regularly asked uh, attitudes which come down to basically social democracy. Like, how do you feel about expenditures for welfare and education and military and uh, taxes and so on. And the answers were quite steady. There was a steady drift right through the Reagan years towards more social democratic positions. That is, more spending for social uh, needs, less spending for military. People were willing, by and large, to accept higher taxes for spending for education and welfare and so on. While all this is going on, you know, the L word is following the S word into oblivion. It doesn't matter that the population is going the other way. The people, who, the people who care, the people, the responsible men are going their way. And their way is power has to get vested even more than before uh, in the narrow sectors of privilege and the population has to be marginalized. So it doesn't matter what the general population thinks as long as they don't do anything about it, as long as they're scattered and dispersed, which they are. Uh, you can see it on the issues that are now lively in the election campaign. Like every day there's more Clinton bashing about the draft. Very striking what Clinton doesn't say. He doesn't say, look, I thought the Vietnam War was not a, was not a mistake, it wasn't a noble cause, it wasn't even a mistake. I thought it was fundamentally wrong and immoral and I honored the people who wouldn't fight in it. He won't say that. Is that an exotic opinion? Well, it's the opinion of 70% of the population that the war is not a mistake, but is fundamentally wrong and immoral. And remarkably, that figure has maintained itself. Nobody ever hears that, you know? Nobody would say that. I mean, you can read maybe, again, at the outer limits, you can read Anthony Lewis telling you the war started with blundering efforts to do good, but it, it, by 1969, we realized it was too costly to ourselves, so we had to pull out. You can hear that. But try to find somebody who says it was fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Well, that's the position of 70% of the population right through the Reagan years. You know? I mean, actually, in the peak of the Reagan years, it went down to 66%. Now it's back to 71, where it was in the 70s. It's a resilient figure, but nobody can express it publicly. It may be people's individual opinion, but it's not a collective opinion. You're not allowed to have it collectively, just like you're not allowed to think collectively that the economic system is inherently unfair. Uh, the same was incidentally true on the Iraq war. Uh, up until the, like the last polls were taken a day or two before the bombing, the public was two to one in favor, two to one in favor of a negotiated settlement which would involve Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait in the context of an international conference on Middle East problems. Now suppose that people had known that two weeks before Iraq had made that proposal it had been released by U.S. officials, and the U.S. had flatly rejected it. Suppose people had known that that's exactly what Iraqi Democrats were calling for. Then the figure wouldn't have been two to one. It would have been 98 percent, you know. But nobody knew it because the press did its job. It was totally suppressed. I mean, it had been suppressed since the preceding August. Uh, the president had said there will be no negotiations, so everyone, it was like 100 percent, you know, statistical error here and there. But about as close to 100% as you can come in a complicated system. Uh, marched on command, everything was suppressed, no negotiation. Nevertheless, individually people wanted that, not collectively. And so it goes on issue after issue. I won't continue, but uh, there's a crucial, there's a striking fact in societies that do not have functioning democracy. Namely, individual opinions are completely different than collective opinions on issue after issue. The collective opinion, the one that's articulated and can be expressed, and people think they, you know, I mean, that's the banner they'll march behind because nobody wants to be crazy. You want to be like everybody else. So you believe that everybody else is the collective opinion. 
those differ radically from what people think in their, you know, when they're isolated. Now, that's always been understood, and it has always been understood that the way to ensure that democracy doesn't work is to, uh, is to prevent people from coming together. Uh, this has been understood on all sides. It's been understood by the business classes. Uh, you want to keep people isolated, separated. Ideal is everybody sits alone in their living room looking at the tube, you know, no popular associations, no unions, no political clubs, nothing like that. Everybody isolated. Then they can think what they want. They can have whatever individual opinions they want will run the collective opinions. It's also understood on the other side. So, for example, one of the main Wobbly writers, nobody reads because he's a Wobbly, uh, says 50 years ago that the papers have taken us one at a time and convinced us how good the times are. We have no opportunity to consult our neighbor to find if the press speaks the truth. Well, that's the trick. Make sure there's no opportunities to consult your neighbor. Uh, in fact, that's the genius of American democracy. You take a look at the elections that are going on. People come up and say, vote for me. I'll do X, Y, and Z. Nobody much believes them. But what doesn't happen is more interesting. What doesn't happen is uh, people get together in their unions or their political clubs or their churches or whatever other organizations they have and work out collectively together their ideas about what ought to happen in the country in every respect, and then put forth representatives who are going to advocate their positions. I mean, that's unthinkable. We, 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 don't, even, we don't have mechanisms for that. We don't have the, the whole idea can't exist, but that's also democracy. Uh, and anything short of that is not democracy. Anything short of that is the bewildered herd being asked every once in a while to lend their weight to one or another leader. Uh, it's in that respect that we are, you know, we're back to the sense in which we're uh, an inspiration to democracy in our time, not in that kind of sense of democracy, not in the sense in which the general population can actually participate in determining policy, setting policy, having ideas, having thoughts, working them out with other people, putting them in the political arena, and having them represented. That not. Well, this discussion is about erosion of democracy, and in some respects it has been eroding over the last 30 years. But just final comment, we should bear in mind that it's not uniform. There's plenty of tension. Things have also been going in the opposite direction. So there is much more uh, public awareness and concern and even activism than there was, say, 30 years ago, dramatically more. Uh, you can see it in every area in which you look. Take, say, October 1992, big month coming along, uh, the commemoration of 500 years of European world conquest. If that had taken place in 1962, it would be exactly what it had always been in the past, a celebration of the liberation of the hemisphere. Uh, it's not going to be that this time. In fact, it won't be much of, at all. Uh, but it's now been downgraded to an encounter, not a liberation. And there are plenty of people who know that it was an encounter pretty much in the sense in which the Warsaw Ghetto was an encounter. Uh, plenty of people know that too. So there's, uh, there certainly won't be a celebration, that's for sure. That's a big change over 30 years. Uh, it's the first time in 500 years that that has taken place, that level of awareness and understanding of what the conquest meant. And that's a very important consequence of a significant uh, rise in the cultural level of the general population in, since the 1960s, which shows up in all sorts of other respects as well. I mean, the feminist movement, the environmental movement, the solidarity movements with Central America were a striking case. All of this has changed the general public quite considerably. And uh, people in power are aware of it, uh, the, uh, and they're worried about it. I'm convinced that part of the reason for this very carefully orchestrated uh, PC campaign has been fear, you know, real fear that people are getting out of control. I mean, there really are people, you know, around who aren't in, who don't like racist and sexist uh, repression and who have respect for other cultures and who don't think you ought to murder everybody in sight. There are all these bad people around and it's hard to suppress them, so we'll scream about them being politically correct or, you know, left fascists or something or other. Uh, uh, but none of it works, you know. All and and the the uh, attempt to you know the, the build up the fears and the enthusiasms and so on. It's still not working. 
uh, you still have 70% of the population uh, thinking, contrary to their betters, that the Vietnam War is what it was, you know, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Uh, you still have a situation in which the government recognizes that although there's no deterrent to the use of force anymore with the Russians out of the game, they can't use it because, as the Bush administration put it in a leaked early document, uh, when we confront much weaker enemies, we must defeat them rapidly and decisively because anything else will undercut political support. It's not like the early 60s when you could bomb South Vietnam for years before anybody batted an eyelash. Now you've got to get it over with fast, no casualties, huge propaganda campaign to demonize the enemy and then get done with it because the population doesn't tolerate it anymore. Well, these are developments that are important. They don't have any institutional reflection. They're cultural in some fashion, but I think they're quite important and it sets up a tension, a tension between people who have, are committed to continuing what has been a long, long struggle, centuries long struggle to defend the freedoms that they've got and to extend them and their democratic rights and on the other side powerful forces who uh, will continue their systematic efforts to erase such rights in anything but form. And how that struggle comes out will, as always, determine whether there is to be a world fit for human existence. I think ultimately they will, but it's going to be a rocky road. Uh, right now, Maastricht doesn't look in the cards, but in the long term they'll do it, I think, uh, because it, you know they just uh, unless there are some real changes in the popular scene, you know, reorganization of significant popular forces, the direction in which things are going is to raise the level of decision making out of public control. That's true at every level. So why England doesn't really want it? Well, England doesn't want it because, partly because, see, the British, remember, England is a little bit out of Europe. England is more like the United States. Uh, they were subjected to Reaganite policies in the 1980s, so they're a disaster area, like the United States is, uh, for the same reason. Same is true of Australia. Uh, <clears throat> there they sort of, most, most often, uh, the Western countries don't take their free market rhetoric seriously. They understand that this is just a rhetorical device to suppress people with. It's not for us. It's just for the third world. But occasionally they make the mistake of taking semi-seriously, at least, uh, their rhetoric. And when they do, it's always a disaster, just like it's a disaster for the third world or for Eastern Europe. Uh, now, they never do it much, you know, but they do to some extent. And Britain, like the United States and Australia, did it to some extent in the 80s. So you've got you know, huge debt at every level and collapse of the social base and you know, all the usual problems that show up typically under structural adjustment in the third world. Therefore, they can't really compete with Europe. You know, Europe maintained a kind of social contract, has more powerful unions and so on. I mean, it's like a generation behind in this process, so it's still functioning. <clears throat> and uh, England is in trouble if you listen to the uh, parliamentary debate today over the radio, uh, you could hear it. <clears throat> and th also England has illusions that Europe doesn't have. England had, it was the great power. You know, it ran the world. And they still have illusions about that. Uh, England has had illusions about a special relationship with the United States ever since the Second World War. U.S. planners regarded it as a joke. I mean, in the internal record, you, you get people like Mansfield, the uh, Kennedy advisor, saying that uh, England is our lieutenant. And then he says the fashionable word is partner. Well, the British only hear the partner part. You know, they don't hear the lieutenant part. But they still think they're somehow our part partners of the big guy down the street, uh, namely the U.S. And so they don't want to completely 
lose that alleged special relationship. So for a number of reasons, some of them kind of historical romanticism, others <coughs> the impact of Thatcherite programs and other things too, not just long-term natural development, they're not in a good position to join in with Europe. That's why they had to pull out of the currency. Maybe. I mean, the pound was just collapsing. They couldn't stay in. Italy could sort of barely manage, but England couldn't. However, I, my feeling is they'll get back together. Uh, it's just too important for the transnational corporations and the other major power units. Could you speak on the presence of allowing the United States to become so much of a debt? Was there, there any control over the debt? Oh, yeah. No, just simply ask yourself who. What about, um, what was the purpose in allowing the U.S. to fall so much into debt? Well, uh, uh, one answer is given if you simply ask the question, who owns the debt and who's going to pay it? Okay. Well, the people who are going to pay the debt are the poor. The people who they're going to pay it to are the rich. I mean, who owns the treasury securities and, you know, the bonds and so on? So the, the debt itself is a kind of transfer of resources from the poor to the rich. Furthermore, the debt has uh, consequences. They were actually described, quite frankly, if you remember, about 10 years ago by David Stockman when he was kicked out of the government. He said, look, the debt puts a cap on social spending. I mean, there is, we want to stop anything. I mean, this is going to be a welfare state for the rich. You know. more, it always is. But more than before, it's going to be a welfare state for the rich which means we'll have plenty of subsidies for the Pentagon and all that kind of stuff, all the state intervention for the rich, uh, which is the big welfare program, but we'll cut down on the pennies that go to the poor, you know, aid to welfare, you know, to dependent mothers and that sort of thing. And the way you make sure that there's a cap on those programs is to be so deeply in debt that there's just no money around. And that's worked. I mean, even if somebody came along who wasn't a business candidate, right now, there's not a lot they could do. You know, the, the parameters have been set so narrowly that there are no social policies that can be carried out very much anymore because we're just too deeply in debt. Uh, the debt probably went well beyond what any planners rationally wanted. I mean, it got to the level of household debt, you know, individual debt, is at a level which has no historical precedent. I mean, corporate debt had reached very high levels. I think it's picking up, it's recovering now, you know, but uh, at every level, federal, state, local, you know, debt is enormous. I mean, so much so, that's, you know, if you, I mean, you know, I'm just, just about old enough to remember the Great Depression, and those of you who are my age or older will remember that things were bad, but they weren't like now. Like, you know, you, you weren't finding that, I mean, the, I, I'm starting to get letters from people in American cities of the kind I get from the third world, where people say, could you send me a book? You know, the public library in Sacramento is closed down. And that's the kind of letter you get from Central Africa. You know? Now you're starting to get it from places like Sacramento, major American cities, because it's true, public services have shut down. There, there aren't the libraries there were in the 1930s. You know, the trains don't run, you can't walk in the park. The, the schools are collapsing. The next big target is the schools. I mean, it's called privatization. But it's a technique to ensure that the public doesn't get the services because the public is irrelevant. The public has been dismissed as irrelevant. Services should go to the wealthy. So you'll privatize the schools and the rich will get what they want and the general public, they can, the only, only one service has to be maintained for the poor, prisons, which have to be increased. So we've had this huge rise in prison population. We're now way ahead of anybody else in the world. We passed South Africa years ago. Uh, and that is good because that gets rid of a large part of the irrelevant population. It also incidentally gives a kind of Keynesian stimulus to the economy. It's a big boost to the construction business. Uh, people like us who've been talking about conversion for years uh, have never really been talking a lot of sense. Uh, Pentagon expenditures are very functional. That's the way you maintain high-tech industry. Uh, you make the public pay the costs, and then if there's anything that comes out of it, it goes to private corporations. But it's harder to do that now through the Pentagon system. You need other measures of stimulation of the economy. Uh, the federal highway building program was one, and a big one. It ran to, I think, uh, well over $100 billion. 
and had enormous effects on the uh, country as well as subsidizing the construction industry. Well, prisons are doing it too. It subsidizes the construction industry. It even creates employment. The fastest growing white collar job in the United States is security guard. You know? And it keeps lots of people out of, out of the way. So that kind of service can maybe increase, but not things like schools or hospitals or anything, libraries, you know, things that serve the undeserving public. Now, you know, the debt is part of this. I'm not saying that somebody sat down and thought, you know, this is going to be all the consequences. It's just the natural result of orienting state policies even more than usual toward the wealthy sector that are the only ones that count. I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's impossible. I mean, I, it, you know, I mean, I'm sort of playing. I mean, I'm maybe not doing it skillfully, but I'm trying to be two characters at once. One of whom is speaking from the point of view of the rulers and the way they're looking at things, and the other from the point of view of what the general public ought to do. For example, there's no reason for anybody to accept the framework in which decisions are made on any issue. People have never accepted it in the past, and that's why we don't live under slavery. You know? I mean, anything that's decent that's ever happened, and plenty of decent things have happened, remember, it still is the freest country in the world. You know? And it got that way because of struggle, not because somebody wrote things down on paper. I mean, take, say, freedom of speech. The United States is, as far as I know, the freest country in the world in, with regard to freedom of speech. We have rights of freedom of speech. They just don't have anywhere else, at least nowhere else that I know of. Uh, but it didn't get that way because somebody wrote something down on paper. I mean, the law of seditious libel, which makes it a crime to criticize people in government, you know, it's a, it's a crime, that's basically what it amounts to. You can assault the government by speech. That's what seditious libel is. Most countries still have that. We had it until 1964. And it was overcome finally. Of course, the Supreme Court struck it down, but they didn't do it in a vacuum. They did it in the course of the civil rights struggle. You know, there's a big civil rights movement which had gotten to the point where the Supreme Court simply had to strike down the law of seditious libel in a civil rights case. Well, you know, that's the way every other victory has been won too. Uh, and uh, so far, they, you know, and it goes around all sorts of things. It still has not hit the heart of the society, namely the economic institutions. They've been insulated. And we're not even allowed to look at them. You know, we're not allowed to think that there's something inherently wrong with the economic institutions. Again, individually, people think it. You know, and the extent to which they think it is kind of remarkable. Now, let me give you one last poll result, which is intriguing. In the mid-'80s, uh, there was a study done in, in which they, people were asked what they thought was in the Constitution. You know, uh, nobody knows what's in the Constitution. You know, but people regard the Constitution as kind of holy writ. You know? So if something is completely ob an obvious truth must be in the Constitution. That's the kind of response you get. And it was interesting to look at the end. They're giving a lot of statements. Do you think this is in the Constitution or not? Well, one of them that half the population thinks is in the Constitution, because it's such an obvious truism, is uh, the statement, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. You know, half the population thinks that such an obvious truth has got to be in the Constitution. You know. Well, you know, try, try expressing that individual thought publicly. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I mean, it really takes work to try to, you really, you can see why, how important it is to separate people from one another. But of course, that's the way change takes place too, by overcoming that separation. I mean, like take, say, the media. You know, they're not worse than they were 30 years ago or 100 years ago. You start reading them, I mean, I just happened to have been reading the press from about 100 years ago because of the you know, because of the Homestead strike, the breaking, there's the, there's the 100th anniversary of the breaking of the American labor movement uh, at Homestead in 1892, and it 
you know, then after 50 years kind of revived and now it's been destroyed again. So it's interesting. And I was looking at the newspapers back then and, you know, they're much worse than they are now. I mean, you know, they were just viciously anti-labor and anti-worker and racist and everything else. Furthermore, at that time, you had something you didn't have now. You had hundreds of labor newspapers, big ones. I mean, Appeal to Reason, the big Socialist Party paper, had, I think, two million subscribers or something like that, huge number of subscribers. And these were professionally done newspapers. I mean, some of them were ethnic, some were religious, some were, uh, you know, some were coming out of parties and, when, and you know, just had big parts of the population, had other places they could go to get a picture of the world. Well, you know, it took 100 years, well, 60 years to destroy that. And, if, and that's, the destruction of that is part of the reason why when uh, caterpillar workers in Peoria uh, uh, were, uh, this last June, something quite important in American history happened. For the first time in 60 years, an American corporation was willing to bring in scabs to destroy a major union, UAW. It hasn't happened for a long time. Well, when the Caterpillar workers who, you know, who had built Peoria, I mean, that the reason Peoria is not a miserable slum is because of 60 years of union organizing, they found that they had no support in the community. You know, okay, that's a big ideological victory for uh, the business classes. Uh, the idea that you should have solidarity, that the idea of solidarity, of support for others, that you care about somebody else, to a significant extent that's been wiped out of people's heads, but it can be put back in again, just like it always was. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's the constant struggle that goes on. I mean, you take a look at the history of slavery, you know, slave revolt after slave revolt, some of them put down, put down viciously, violently, okay, finally slavery was overthrown. First in Haiti, actually. Part of the reason why Haiti is suffering so much now is because of the Western reaction to that victorious slave revolt, which terrified the Western world. The U.S. Didn't, itself didn't recognize Haiti for 60 years. You know. Israel. It's not important. I mean, there's a kind of a right-wing mythology about the Trilateral Commission, but it's mostly mythology. I mean, I used to read all their stuff, but frankly, I stopped because it was so boring. It's, uh, uh, I mean, it's a kind of talk session among rich people and their lackeys uh, of the more or less liberal side, you know. And they say pretty much the kind of things you'd expect them to say. I mean, occasionally they let their hair down and say things more openly, like in this Crisis of Democracy book, but it's pretty rare. I mean, mostly it's not very different from what you'll read in the literature of the Council on Foreign Relations or, you know, the... Uh, the main intellectual journals. You know. I mean, it's sort of the liberal side of the international ruling class. But it, it's not that they plan the world or anything, you know, just a lot of rich guys who get together every now and then and talk. Bush, too? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not surprising because almost anybody semi-rational is associated with the Trilateral Commission. See, the Trilateral Commission came out in the 1970s out of a real phenomenon, you know, which you can't laugh out. Namely, the world had become trilateral, or tripolar as it's now called. I mean, around 1970, there was a big change, you know, much bigger than the end of the Cold War. Uh, by 1970, from 1945 to 1970, you know, not like one day, but over that period, uh, there was a kind of a period of affluence of growth, you know, in the capitalistic, state capitalist economies, and it was under U.S. domination. By 1970, that was pretty well over. Uh, this was sometimes called the end of the affluent alliance. Uh, there were severe pressures on corporate profits. Uh, high growth rates were never resumed. Uh, the economies have been sort of stagnating ever since. Real wages in the U.S. have been actually declining since then. And the U.S., mainly because of the Vietnam War, was no longer able to be the uh, kind of centerpiece of the world economy. The U.S. had been the international banker, basically. Couldn't maintain that position by 1970. Uh, Nixon, in August 1971, dismantled the entire international system, the Bretton Woods system that had been established at the end of the Second World War, in which the U.S. was the banker of last resort. You know, he dismantled it, 
Uh, he introduced import uh, surcharges. He uh, changed the goal. Uh, the dollar had been $35 an ounce. You know, that was fixed, the fixed rate for international funds. We eliminated that. It began to float. Uh, there was a whole series of changes that were made that essentially eliminated the international economy. And the world, and it was a reflection of the fact that the world was tripolar, or becoming tripolar, you know, with a German-based sector and a Japan-based sector and a U.S.-based sector. Well, you know, anybody who had their head screwed on could see that. And the Trilateral Commission was just one reflection of that, of that fact. So, of course, everybody was some kind of trilateralist. Maybe not everyone joined the commission, but, you know, the commission wasn't all that unusual. It was just the sort of more liberal side of this group. You've been talking for about two hours. How long can you keep going? Uh, as long as, as long as people don't walk out. How about two more questions? <laughs> okay, I'll try to be a little briefer. I can't really see very well back there. Is there some? Yeah. Uh, could you comment a little bit more about Seven, yeah, 1990. Well, the, the phrase was, the question is, people, here's the story. People are given a set of, it's on all foreign policy issues, you know. There's a study of all foreign policy issues. It's done every four years uh, by the Gallup organization. That's an interesting study. And each, on each topic, you're given a set of choices. And the question is, you're supposed to say which one do I strongly agree with or large, you know, that kind of thing. And the one, uh, the one in question was, in the Vietnam War, there's a set of choices, like, you know, noble cause, I mean, whatever. Uh, one of them at the extreme is fun not a mistake, but fundamentally wrong and immoral. All right, that one's been running over two-thirds of the population. In 1982, it was 72%. In 1986, it went down to 66%. That was after four years of Reaganism. I just yesterday saw the one for 1990, which just came out. It's back up to 71 percent. Not a mistake. Fundamentally wrong and immoral. See, the farthest out you can get in the intellectual community is it was a mistake. Okay, so if you take a look at you know articulate people, people who can you know people who can, people who are considered articulate dissidents, they'll say yeah, it was a mistake. But the public doesn't. They say it was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral, which is correct. It wasn't a, it was not, it was, it was, it's not a mistake anymore. The invasion of Afghanistan was a mistake. Of course, the invasion of Afghanistan was a mistake, but that's not the problem with it. You know, the problem with it is it was fundamentally wrong and immoral. We can see that about Afghanistan, and most of the population here can see it about Vietnam, which is very interesting because they never heard it. You know, they can just think it individually. I'm sure that if, they, if you ask people, does anybody else think that or just you, they'd say, I'm the only person in the world who thinks it. That happens to be 71% of the population. He can't, he, well, no, he couldn't because he would be cut off from his uh, business supporters. You know, he's, after all, a representative of the business community. They don't want people to think that. What prevents it? Of authoritarian? Authoritarian? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah. 
Well, there are a lot of factors. Look, I mean, yeah, the question is what prevents people from getting organized and associated? And, you know, what, she gave the example of UMass Boston, a working class school, uh, which is being smashed like every popular institution. But the students who are getting smashed don't want to do anything about it. They're apathetic. You know, they don't get together and organize and so on. Uh, and uh, the specific question was, if I heard you right, what is the role of authoritarianism, authoritarian ideology in this? Well, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to try to give a glib answer or even pretend that I know the answer, but I don't. But if you look at American history, I mean, you know, organizing is not easy. Uh, it is by no means easy. I mean, the organization of unions, uh, which is one of the main kinds of organizing, was a bitter, brutal struggle. Uh, hundreds of, uh, the United States happens to have an unusually violent labor history. Uh, I think uh, hundreds, probably thousands, of American workers were simply murdered uh, during a period when almost nobody was killed in Europe. I mean, it wasn't until eight, 1935 with the Wagner Act that American workers finally got the rights that had been granted in Europe in the late 19th century. You know, that's why the Homestead Affair is so interesting. I don't want to call it a strike, which everybody calls it because it wasn't. It was a lockout. But the Homestead lockout 100 years ago, which destroyed the American Steel Workers Union, very important event. Nobody, no. It ought to be, everybody ought to know about it. It's one of the most important events in American history. We just had a, the 100th anniversary. And it was a very, you know, they called in the National Guard to destroy the Union. And they killed a lot of people. And that was the end of it. There was nothing else in Homestead until 1935. Uh, that's, uh, during that period, there was plenty of brutal repression. Uh, in 1919, under Woodrow Wilson, that's nothing to do with liberals and conservatives, incidentally. Wilson was supposed to be aggressive. That was probably the most violent period in, anti -la in labor history. There was a violent repression under Wilson, uh, which destroyed other uh, post-war attempt, post-World War attempts to organize it, destroy the independent press. They kicked thousands of people out of the country. I mean, there was this Red Scare, it was called. Uh, and it was brutal. You know, we then went into 10 years of almost total apathy. In the 1930s, people got started organizing again. It was again brutal. I mean, after the Wagner Act in 1935, the next strike wave in 1936 and 37, they were mostly suppressed and often by violence. A lot of workers were killed in the little steel strikes in 1937. And that's the way it goes. And, you know, killing is just the superficial, you know, that's like the icing on the cake. I mean, there's plenty of repression short of killing. And it's tough. You know, people lose their jobs, they get blacklisted, they get, uh, uh, if you try it in a university, you know, you probably, you'll, you'll get, they may not officially blacklist you, but you get into trouble, you know. There's all kind of ways of getting rid of people who are troublemakers from kindergarten on up, you know. Uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, organizing succeeds when people are willing to face those pressures and overcome them. And it's hard to know what the secret is. Sometimes people do it. You know, I mean, you take take a look at places where people, you know, where I mean, we for us it's a picnic. What we call repression in most of the world would be called a, a gift. You know, I mean, go to a place like say El Salvador and try to organize there. You know, there it's not a matter of oh yeah they don't like you. I mean, you end up in a, you know, in a, in a ditch cut to pieces with, uh, you know, after torture. That's what it means to organize there. But they still do it. They keep coming back, you know. Tens of thousands slaughtered, and they keep coming back and doing it again. Well, that's organizing. I mean, we don't, you know, we can talk about repression, but we're not talking about anything real by international standards. Uh, and the question is whether you want to put out the energy and the effort to do it. I mean, it happens because enough people decide, yeah, they're going to do it. I mean, look, the anti-war movement in the 60s, to take something recent, started that way. I mean, it started, I, I well remember back around 64 or 63, when I would be giving talks in Unitarian churches, you know, in which there would be four people one of them the organizer, one of them the drunk who had walked off the street, two guys who wanted to kill me, you know. Uh, and that's the way it was until, uh, in 1966 in Boston, which is a very liberal city, we couldn't have meetings in churches. A meeting in the Arlington Street Church was attacked in March 1966, some of you will remember, and the whole church was defaced because there was an anti-war meeting going on inside, and there were students coming over, marching over from the universities. 
Arlington Street Church in downtown Boston. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, it took a long time before things got going. And, you know, that's not real repression. I mean, I don't want to suggest that that's repression, not by the standards of what the U.S. does in our client states, or not even by the standards of what working class organizers have ever faced question is whether uh, one wants to, I mean, the first thing you got to do is overcome the mental apathy. You know, the belief that there's nothing else except what they tell you there is. You know, if you believe there's nothing else except the world depicted in television comedies, okay, then, you know, then they've won. Uh, if you understand, look, that's not the world, then comes the next question, am I going to try to do something about it? If enough people do, things change. agree with that. See, I don't, I don't agree. See, but now, you're, now we're getting to it. And, uh, yeah. There. yeah. Maybe they're secretly the no, they're not. Way, but, uh, yeah. I, I, I agree with everything except the bottom line. I mean, let's take, let's take a really harsh institution that we don't argue about, slavery. Okay, nobody thinks slavery was good, I presume. Nevertheless, everything that you just said could be said about slavery. I mean, if you took a look at the plantation economy, there were masters who were very decent people. They treated the slaves very nicely. In fact, they were treated better than free workers, much better. Uh, they were allowed to live their family lives, you know. I mean, they didn't beat them up or anything. Uh, but it didn't matter. It was slavery. And maybe some of them, you know, gave money to the church and did all kind of decent things. Probably they did, you know, nice people. But the trouble was the institution. The institution was wrong. It doesn't matter whether you do it nicely or not nicely. People, you know, the idea that a person should be owned is just an intolerable infringement on human rights, whether the person who owns them is nice to them or not. And, uh, uh, you know, in the 19th century, it was widely recognized that the same is true of people who are rented. It's an intolerable infringement on people's rights, even if the guy who rents you is nice to you. Uh, the question is whether decisions over investment, production, distribution, what happens on the shop floor, conditions of work, all that kind of stuff, whether those decisions are, should be out of public control. Uh, you go back to the 19th century when there was a live, popular, libertarian, working class movement, and you will read in the Knights of Labor statement publications that wage slavery is not a lot different from slavery. In fact, if you bother to go back to the origins of democratic thought, you know, you really read the classics, the classics of, li when people claim to be, you know, classical liberals and so on, but you go back and read this stuff, you know, like say Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was the inspiration of John Stuart Mill. Uh, he says the leading principle of this, you know, the great classical liberal, you know, the origin of the whole business. Uh, the uh, leading principle of his thought is that human beings are born to, he said, to inquire and create, and to create under their own initiative. Any, if, if any work that a person does under outside pressure is inhuman. If a person creates something beautiful under outside orders, we may admire what he does, but we will despise what he is. Well, that's classical liberal thought. You know. They don't tell you that in the Chicago school. But that's classical, any more than they tell you what Adam Smith really said, which is very different from what's claimed. Uh, but that's classical liberal thought, and it's because it was driven by, you know, concepts of human rights and human dignities, which are seriously infringed by the structure of business operations, even if the guys who run it are nice guys. You can't be a nice guy in certain positions because the institution is not nice. Now, I'm not, you know, like, I'm not saying let's go out and blow up Lotus, you know, sure, not, not at all. I mean, yes, they're among the best ones around. But that doesn't lead us to over, I, sh I, th I think it should not lead us to overlook what's fundamentally wrong with that authoritarian structure. 
actually, I agree with that 50% of the population who thinks that that slogan ought to be in the Constitution. <laughs> The right wing talk shows? Yeah. Like yeah. Instance, yeah. That's an interesting phenomenon. I don't know exactly how it worked, but back in the 60s, there was a much broader range of talk show discussions. I just know from personal experience, I was on them all the time. And over the years, it's been gradually shifting, not just to the right, but to the freaky right, you know? I mean, a tremendous amount of the talk show stuff is what's called libertarian. It has nothing to do with libertarianism, but it's, you know, real extreme right. I mean, of the kind that you don't even find in other industrial societies. And they have a very dominant role. I mean, I didn't do an experiment, but I know just turning them on at random, you hear this stuff all the time. Uh, whether that was a decision or just sort of a natural drift or something, I really don't know. Might be worth looking at. I listen to them a lot, actually. I think they're kind of interesting, yeah. I, I, when I'm driving, I usually try to turn in these, tune, on, turn, tune into these programs, and they're often kind of interesting. I mean, it, I, I think you're getting a very skewed part of the population. I mean, it's not, it's not you know, it's not the, a random s sample of the population that sits there calling into talk shows. But whatever sector it is, uh, you know, they reflect some interesting things now and then. Maybe we should uh, stop and continue this out okay. in the ante room. There's refreshments and good times. Thank okay. you, Jim. accepting it in a medical or dental school, it's almost 50 percent now. Well, MIT, when I went to MIT mm -hmm. teach, there was no women. Oh. When I got there, now it's about a third, and it's going to keep going. Mm -hmm. So they, there's been a great progress.
So you speak just before the Gulf War broke out over at MIT. Um, it was a lecture you entitled uh, The New World Order. And I've noticed that you referred to uh, Kennan a lot. And I always thought it was fascinating in, in reading the quote that you put in there because it, it struck me, all right, here's a man who's very honest in direct power concepts. I'm sorry. It's, it's internal. If you read what he says publicly, mm -hmm. it's very different. I found one of the fascinating things about Kennedy is to compare the internal record, which is now declassified, mm -hmm. with his memoirs, in which he gave his own story. Okay. Well, the thing that I noticed about that, after you put in a quote there, which I actually referenced for the paper because I thought it was quite good, is that. Um, the government at the time, and I would assume it's probably not much different today, considered him to be a dog. He was kicked out. And he was kicked out. Okay. Now, what is it that they're looking for in people like well, that to, know, sound, to sound naive? You want to know what they want? If Take this guy is talking honestly about direct power okay. concepts of dealing with the world, yet they, they thought this guy was soft There's and they an kicked him out. Kennan was replaced by Paul Nitzsche. Right. Uh, as the head of the policy planning staff. Paul Nitzsche's first major production was the most important post-war document. And it's the Reader. If you don't want to read the whole thing, I've got long excerpts from it on Book of Mind called Determined Democracy. And then there you see what they want. I mean, this guy could have come straight out of the you know, by, by comparison to him, Ken and yeah. soft. But I, you know, I guess the thing that I'm, I'm curious about is I don't find that Kennan was saying anything that can sort of suck. You know, maybe I'm being too rational and too sane about. Well, uh, compare it, compare it with NSC 68. Okay, and the other, the other. Um, I mean, you know, Kennan was thinking about possible possibility. He was willing to consider negotiation. He was willing to serve the claims. You know, Mitzi said, "Look, the word of the death." Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and we got to have repression at home because the only way we can defeat them is war. Right, that puts it a little bit on the The other thing I wanted to ask you is I've noticed recently in the news they're doing a lot of focus now on Gulf War veterans and the photochemical illnesses. Now, I worked a lot with the Veterans Center in Mass Boston, and they're pretty much all, well, yeah, it, they work in cooperation with the joiner. I also know several of the professors at the joiner, um, Paul Camacho. And, and all those guys. Um, but they're all pretty much Vietnam era. And what I've noticed in the media is there seems to be a definite shift now from Vietnam era issues and Vietnam era problems, including things like Agent Orange and all that, that type of stuff, into historical memory. And everything since the Gulf War if they're going to do any referencing on veterans and anything like that, they now use the Gulf War veterans, who were supposed to be the dutiful lot that ran over there and you know, saved the world from Saddam Hussein's aggression. And now you're starting to see some lashing out, or a, sort of like a, a slow swelling buildup now of different veterans' issues coming from, from these veterans. Do you think that... The media, to quote the title of your book, you know, the necessary illusions that the media uses to manipulate the public. Do you think that that, in cooperation with the government, who I am assuming is influencing the media, or is the, the corporate interests that are influencing the media on presenting these necessary illusions, 
Do you think that they're now starting to get scared that their replacement of the Vietnam uh, era situation, which I am also assuming was that they have always looked at as a major burr in their saddle, um, do you think that now that they've replaced them with these Gulf War veterans, they're starting to get a little bit worried that the new illusion that they put in place is starting to backfire on them? By the way, you know, as soon as you had you know, Saddam Hussein sitting there laughing at George Bush, it was getting to be an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. In fact, they kind of in trouble with it. You know, they're you know, not talking much. Everybody is saying, including me, that the Desert Storm is going to be a big issue with this you know, big public initiative in this country. They're not talking about it. Because mm -hmm. all they have to do is talk about it and they'll look over there you know, and see who's sharing it. Do you think this might provide a window of opportunity for the veterans to now bring their concerns and their issues to the forefront, that if the older Vietnam era veterans can get together with the younger Gulf veterans, that they can bring this out in the mainstream yeah, of the media, a, yeah, and the government might, might actually have to honor uh, benefits for these people and do something about it, leading to some of this? If you want to see how hard it's going to be, take a look at our senator, Tom Kerry, who was... Uh, he was always an opportunist. Right, he's the um, one that threw the medals, or supposedly yeah. threw the medals. Well, he figured over the in 1970 that's going to be a good way to get himself to be president, which he wanted to be somewhere later. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he was a big anti war activist. Just two days ago, mm -hmm. uh, he was berating Henry Kissinger because Kissinger didn't bomb the house. Did you catch that in the car? Yeah, I did. Uh, there was this, he's uh, running this, uh, you know, now he figures the big thing is to. Uh, get on the MIA and uh, he had Kissinger mm -hmm. testifying before his committee that, you know, uh, his committee, but he's on the committee mm -hmm. and he was badgering Kissinger about the fact that he hadn't been a Russian in the peace treaty about getting our men back from Laos right. and why hadn't he threatened the war and Kissinger turned back and right to him and said you know guys like you who are making harder for us you know, it's good. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the um, idea that Car Kerry would take that position tells you what the weather is going to be up against. Mm -hmm. He was just, I don't know. Sort of like the weather, like the weather vane spinning around. Yeah, he wasn't, well, it didn't look to me like he was looking, he was just making it low. And the, the last quick question I have for you, I'm planning a trip to Asia next year, and I'm hoping to go to Tibet, which has been... Uh, a lousy situation understated for the last 30 years. Well, that's what I'm going to try and do. And what I was wondering, have you, in you're obviously more attuned to a lot of sources that I'm not, have you heard anything? I heard a rumor recently that the Chinese, in trying to get more of the hard currency from the West into their country, are about to open the borders and relax some of the standards, which they tightened up in 88 and 89 due to the riots that they had over there. And are they going to allow more Western people in? And do you think they're actually going to do anything or at least pay some, some more lip service towards uh, the presentations that the Dalai Lama had made about turning the place into a you know, world uh, environmental park and a peace sanctuary? <laughs> You know, they want to hold on to Tibet and they've worked very hard to crush any resistance there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if they're letting those cars in now. Is it strictly for mineral resources that they're doing? Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to give up Arizona. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, if you go back to the history of this, kind of interesting. In the 1930s, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, our guy, was running mm -hmm. China. And the outer provinces were not part of China. I'm very loosely mm -hmm. connected. Tibet and Mongolia and Manchuria were you know, really outer provinces. They were only, the, the West insisted that China take control of it mm -hmm. because it was assumed that that would benefit Western investment. You know, it was our guy running it. So we, so we could go in there and no the mineral reason. And the people like Owen Lattimore were mm -hmm. very bitterly denouncing that back in the 30s. They saying, mm -hmm. these countries that have their own freedom. Mm -hmm. that they were because it's actually been in the, in the Dalai Lama's writing that nowhere in Tibetan history, nor even in Han Chinese history, is it written that Tibet, what's now known as the Tibetan Autonomous Region, was ever part of China. I mean, these things are all mysticism. <laughs> I mean, who owned what a thousand years ago? 
All right, but you, you haven't heard anything in particular that it's going to okay, well, Thank you very much. Yeah. Professor, can you talk briefly about um, the reemergence of fascism in, in uh, Germany? Germany? Yeah, it's scary. I mean, it's not just the need. Oh, look, just a couple of days ago, the, uh, uh, you, you noticed that Germany expelled the gypsies. That's right. Yeah, that's shocking. You know? And the gypsies were treated just like the Jews, you know, in the, during the Holocaust. Just like the Jews. Same, about the same proportion as killed in the world. And uh, Germany simply threw them out, back to Romania. I mean, Every it's, country threw them out. But you know, for well, Germany, there's a it's, particular it's a anger it's against true. refugees. Though. When everybody does it, it's true, it's bad. But when Germany does it, you know, I mean, it's so shocking. You can't even, you know, you're speechless. Well, I thought they had a constitutional law now that they had. They had an open borders law that they had to allow anybody that wanted to come. But you know, Germany's a very racist country. That's I mean, correct. It's not just you know, it's just unbelievable. You know, I mean, they believe in ethnic purity. Actually, a lot of Europe does. You know, we're, we're much different than Europe in that respect. Oh, yeah. It's one of the good things and about the United Japan. States. Japan's, I mean, Japan's probably oh, yeah. worse. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but you go, you travel through Europe, it's not any, you know, their racism is we don't want the guy from the next village. You know. I mean, Europe people tend to be in the place where their grandfather was, to an extent that's not true here. I, I mean, I happened to be in Germany just before the Berlin Wall fell, and, and the hatred of East Germans was you could cut with a knife. I mean, you can't, at least I can't tell the difference between an East German and a West German, maybe they can. But, you know, uh, the idea that those dirty East Germans are going to come to our country, it's just, you know. Germany has always only been unified for a hundred years. Most of Europe has only been unified in what we call well, nation states now. Right. For that Look, I mean, until very recently, people didn't even speak the national language. I mean, it's probably still true. You know, you go to parts of Germany, they don't speak German. Switzerland still has four languages. But even in yeah. Germany, you know, yeah. in Bavaria, can't understand somebody. Napoleon almost unified Europe. Huh? Mm. <laughs> well, it's actually, it's, it's funny. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that, you know, Europe, yeah. is, as it's getting moving towards unification, yeah. it's also it's moving towards sort of devolution. So now you have dozens of little groups. Yeah. You might find a Europe of 35 countries instead yeah. of 8 of the 10 or 11. Right. Scotland, Ireland, Provence, Britain, Basque, Catalonia is much more independent. The Basque are one of those. I don't even remember them all. Cut between every like the Kurds and oh, come on, I got a son-in-law who's a militant Basque nationalist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it's it, it's funny that you should mention that question. I work in a retail store in Boston, and right now because the Deutsche Mark is so strong, there are a lot of German tourists coming into Boston. And so, seeing all the scenes on TV about the skinheads and the neo-Nazi fascists and what they're doing to the immigrants in Germany, I've been asking these people, you know, what's going on in your country, why is this happening? They seem to be downplaying it. Now, I don't know if it's a sense of denial or if it's a sense of our media control trying to hype it up for whatever reason they want to hype people, it up, but they don't seem... Lexington, yeah. Boston. Hmm. How, how often have I been in Dorchester? If, pe if I read in the Boston Globe that yeah. people are getting murdered every day in Dorchester, for yeah. all I know, it could be happening in, in the yeah. right. I mean, you know, you can live very yeah. close to something physically and not live close to it psychologically. And the German tourists who are coming here are not the ones who are smashing up the, the images. Yeah. Those are the guys down the street. You know, into the Professor, can you compare that situation to the Republican Party's platform? American Republican Party? Yeah, the, yeah, the type of fascism you see in both situations. The Republican Party is very interesting in that respect. It's got real fascist streak to it. I mean, this, you know, the way that they are turning to what they call cultural issues, you know, to try to divert people away from the economic issues, and, you know, the rhetoric about social programs and family values and stuff, it's not very far. I mean, the stuff that I was reading from Hitler, it's not very far, you know. I mean, if I hadn't told you who it was, I bet you there were people who thought that came out from Pat Robertson, mm -hmm. but it was Adolf Hitler, you know. uh, and mm -hmm. Hitler. No, 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 no. Oh, Pat Robertson, mm -hmm. yeah, that's one of these guys. You know? I mean, the differences are not that great. You know, you read the kind of stuff that's coming out about liberals and women and blacks and you know, affirmative action. And homosexuals too. Homosexuals. It's not very different from what I read, and that's, and I think the, me the mechanism is the same. I mean, it's a way of trying to mobilize a mass of a population who you're going to strangle. 
and who are rude and who suffer, you know, and you want to mobilize them around something. You make them feel that their families are under attack, yes. or their homes are under attack, or their job is under attack, or you know, something they love is under attack by somebody, no matter who it is. Uh, that's, that's a very deeply fascist concept. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Well, we, Haiti? I wish I did, but it's, I mean, the U.S. has, you know, the U.S. has 200 years of history in Haiti. We have always been against Haitian independence. Mm -hmm. Nothing new. Mm -hmm. I mean, the U.S. sent troops to Haiti to try to put down slavery. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, in 1793 or something like that. It's 200 years we've never changed. We were the last one to recognize them. We didn't recognize them until the Civil War. Uh, we invaded in 1915, a vicious invasion. We had 20 years, supported Duvalier after that. Mm -hmm. The minute Duvalier went out, we started trying to reinstitute it. I mean, you know, the U.S. has been trying to undercut our speed in every possible way. Uh, it's, unless something happens in the United States. I mean, unless some, I mean, actually, it's interesting these guys understand it. The, the New York Times had an article. Remember, the, the, uh, in February 4th, Washington essentially canceled the embargo. Yes. They said, okay. yes. Three days later, the Times had a front page article by their Haitian correspondent, Howard French, and he said something like this. He said, uh, as long as there's no opposition to Washington's policies, uh, they're just going to continue this. Well, it happened that the day that article came out, I was in New York, the whole city was shut down by a remark, except the people were all black. That doesn't count as opposition. That's right. Okay. In fact, I, I looked in the press, there's almost nothing about it. I haven't been in Alaska, I read it in the Alaska press. You know. But in Boston and Miami, the cities were pretty much shut down. The only reason I knew it was I was trying to get to the airport and couldn't get anywhere. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, okay, but, but that's not, but the point is that, you know, unless there's opposition from people who have clout, mm -hmm. not just New York black, mm -hmm. then yeah, they'll go on doing exactly mm -hmm. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Just like the New York Times told you. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer. Yep, but you, you did involve yourself in the film with uh, the Dennis Yeah, but you know, it's got to be more than that. I, um, I know. I mean, I it's got to be real, you know, it's got to be real dedicated involvement to get policies to change. I mean, the U.S. You know, has pretty much what it wants. It wanted Mark Bezos to be. The white coincidence, he lost yeah, the election. He got 14% of the vote, now. now he's prime minister. Big Ooh. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Thank you very much. I want to raise. something about the Joiner Center? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty friendly with several professors. Are any of them working on, on medical military issues? Um, yeah, I mean, they're working, you know, they work on, on that type of stuff all the time. The, the present problem for them is is that um, 